Well, thank you for being a part of the indoor gathering as we come back. But I also want to say to those of you who are watching in Founders Hall, um, I am so glad that you're able to be together and that you're able to watch. And those of you who are watching at home and online or wherever you might be um, watching this from, you are still a part of Pineville Church. Because that's what it's taught us over these last couple of months, that even when we were not indoors, even when we've been in our homes or wherever we've been or outdoors in the drive-in, we have still been together. Because that, that is what the Spirit of Jesus does. It draws us together. And so wherever you're watching from, I am so glad that you're part of this gathering. And I look forward to, to talking to you today. We, we are continuing a series called blockbuster weekends and we've been looking at different movies and how we can find the gospel message because this is this is amazing how God works he can speak through anything he can speak anywhere and he can speak at any time a lot of times it's whether or not we are looking listening we're watching and paying attention for where his presence is well we looked at uh this this past weekend, on Friday night, we finally got to have the movie. The weather did not win. We stuck it out, pulled everything out right as soon as those last few raindrops passed by. And we watched The Empire Strikes Back. Um, it was the, the middle of the, the first sequel or the first um, trilogy of movies in the Star Wars trilogy that came out in the, the late 70s, early 80s. And the base, the storyline behind Empire Strikes Back, because it was a sequel, it was, it was uh, basically the, the rebels had destroyed the mega weapon called the Death Star. Everything had been going really well. Luke Skywalker had decided he was going to become a Jedi, and it looked like they were on the up and up. But in the Empire Strikes Back, it starts off with the fact that the Empire is now coming down hard on them. It knows where they are, and it destroys their home base. And all the rebels, they're having to flee and figure out something else to do and, and how they're going to fight back against the empire. And, and it has them in a pickle, right? It has a situation where they're on the run. And so our, our crew of, of heroes, Princess Leia, Chewbacca, Han Solo, CP3, C3PO, <laughs> R2D2, they all run to this place called cloud city and the empire follows them and they catch up to them and darth vader has figured out that there's something about this character this guy luke skywalker that he wants to draw luke out and capture him because he doesn't want him to go stronger and, and become a jedi and so they get to Cloud City, and they, they, uh, they capture the, the crew, and, and, and Luke comes to try to help save them. He, he comes, and the trap has been set, and there's this epic battle that goes down between Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. Darth Vader was the guy that was out here earlier. And in this epic, this epic battle, this epic lightsaber fight that goes down, we discover something. And I was thinking about this last night. Like, if you had watched this for the first time back in the 80s when these first came out, this, this discovery, this plot twist in this trilogy would have blown your mind. As at the very end, in the middle of this massive battle between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, do you know what Darth Vader says to Luke Skywalker? Now, a lot of people think that he says, Luke, I am your father. But he actually only says, I'm your father. That's my best. Sorry, not very low this morning. I'm your father, right? And so all of a sudden we realize that, that there's something, you know, this, this just completely blows the whole thing. Like, what's going to happen next? You know, now that we see that, that Darth Vader is Luke's father, and, and so there, there's, it just, in the moment of that mystery, this is when the tide begins to turn. And as that movie ends, it ends kind of on a low point because Luke ends up being defeated by Darth Vader. Although he doesn't die, he escapes and his friends save him and they escape. But if you were to watch the rest, the next, the next episode in the movie, you would see that at the end of that movie, because Luke finds out that Darth Vader is his dad, he's able to convince Vader to come over to the light side, to the good side, 
And eventually at the end, and, and I didn't even know this, this is going to be bad, but I didn't know this until like maybe last year, that the reason it's called Return of the Jedi is because Darth Vader comes back to the good side and he becomes a Jedi again, right? So if you didn't know that, sorry. But it all goes back to that moment. It all goes back to that moment when Darth Vader says to Luke, I am your father. That's the turning point. There's a story in the Old Testament about a guy named Joseph. Joseph is the son of a man named Jacob. And, and this is found in, in the very first Bible of the or very first book of the Bible in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. And, and Joseph is the son of Jacob. He's one of 12 sons. And, and uh, I, I got to tell you, he's one of the youngest sons in those 12, the second to youngest. And being myself, being one who is, is um, I am, I'm the, the fifth son out of five boys, I, I, can, I can identify a lot with Joseph at times. See, Joseph is loved by his father, Jacob. Joseph uh, even receives this special coat from Jacob. The, you might have heard of it, the coat of many colors. And Joseph knows just how much his father loves him. In fact, if you were to read this story about Joseph's life, early on in Joseph's life, he might have even gotten carried away a little bit at times with his brothers. In fact, he has a few dreams early on in his life when, when he, he dreams about how his brothers and people are going to all bow down and, and, and listen to him, and he's going to be in charge of everybody, including his brothers. And, and being one of the youngest brothers, you can only imagine how well that went over with his brothers. It made his brothers angry at him. It made them jealous of him. And they decided one day that they weren't going to take it anymore. In fact, it ends up where Joseph when comes to find them and to help them. His father sends him to go and work with them. And when they see Joseph coming, they come up with this plot, this idea. At first, they were going to kill Joseph. They were so mad at him and so jealous of him and so angry with, with what he thought he was going to do and angry about his dreams and angry about the fact that his father loved him so much. And so they were going to kill him. And at the last second, they decide not to kill him. We'll throw him into a pit. And then, as they threw him in the pit, a group of, of slave traders arrived on the scene. And it ends up they sell Joseph to these slave traders who take Joseph back to the land of Egypt, far away from where they lived. And in their mind... He was as good as dead. In fact, they end up telling their father that his beloved son is actually dead. Now, Joseph ends up having this extraordinary life, right? He goes from being this enslaved guy, this enslaved Hebrew, thrown in a pit, picked up by these slave traders, taken back to Egypt. He goes from that to, to being in charge of a high-ranking official's home in Egypt. And from there, he becomes falsely accused of sexual assault by that guy's wife and sent to prison. But in prison, he becomes well-respected by prison officials, giving counsel to people who have unusual dreams. And at one point, he even, at, 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 the, at one of the biggest point, turning points in his life, he even is able to counsel the Pharaoh of Egypt, this, this king-type position, this Pharaoh's dreams. And then he finally becomes the right-hand man for Pharaoh, for all of Egypt, right? A pretty amazing life. Some up and downs, but pretty amazing. And all of it happens around a 20-year period. Can you imagine the emotional experience that would have felt like, right? The emotions that he might have experienced going from being this guy who was, who was basically put into slavery, his brothers turning on him, throwing him into a pit, throwing his life and, 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 and sending his life through so much suffering, so much pain. What Joseph experienced at the very beginning when his brothers threw him in the pit, when his brothers sold him into slavery, that should have been the end of Joseph's story. 
See, Joseph would have had every right from that moment on to allow what happened to him to be what defined him forever. Joseph simply should have been a Hebrew slave disowned by his brothers, and that should have been all that was written. But apparently that was not. See, God had a purpose. God had a purpose for Joseph's life. See, this pandemic... Maybe you find yourself without a job. Maybe the, the uncertainty is overwhelming you. The anxiety, the anxiety of, of school starting, good grief. The feeling of being a failure in the midst of this. All of that does not have to be what defines your life. See, life's challenges that knock you down do not have to be the end of your story. I'm going to tell you that one more time because I think more than ever we need to hear that this morning in the midst of all the chaos that's going on around us. Life's challenges that knock you down do not have to be the end of your story. Whether they are unfair moments, you can't predict a pandemic, or whether they are brought on by yourself. God has given you more to live for beyond the brokenness that seems insurmountable. God has given you more to live for beyond the brokenness that seems insurmountable. So Joseph's life finally stables out, right? From a Hebrew slave disowned by his own flesh and blood to a person given power by a Pharaoh over the land of Egypt. Life is finally good. Until one day, something out of the blue steps back into his life that he was not quite prepared to see. You see, the dreams that Pharaoh had, the ones that Joseph counseled him on with the help of God, had to do with a season of abundance followed by a season of severe drought. Joseph is put in charge of, of managing the whole process that prepares Egypt for the severe drought by carefully saving during the season of abundance. See, this drought, however, goes beyond the borders of Egypt and even reaches to the land where Joseph was from, the land of Canaan. And it affects his brothers and his father and all their families. And you get this sense throughout the story of Joseph's life in Egypt. He isn't even thinking about this impact on the land where he's from. He's very focused on the work and the job that he's been given. Until one day when the ten brothers, his ten brothers who had sold him into slavery, who essentially threw his life away, they show up because they need food for their families. We're going to pick it up in Genesis chapter 42. Listen to what happens when Joseph comes in contact with them again. Verse 6. Since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. But listen. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from, he demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied. We have come to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he had had about them many years before. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. No, my Lord, they exclaimed. Your servants have simply come to buy food. Here Joseph has all the power in the world, right, at his fingertips. And, and his brothers now are, are basically at his mercy. They are here needing his help. And you know that it even says he remembers, if he remembered the dreams that he had when he was younger, then he also must remember everything that had happened to him. All the things that, the, the, the things that they had done to him. The fact that they sold him into slavery. You know he remembers that. And probably in a moment, it flashes through his life. Thinking about all those ups and downs. The moments where he was falsely accused. The moments where he was treated terrible. 
and he remembers. He remembers the fact that he wasn't with his father, that he had missed out on being part of the family. And now here they were, and they needed help. Their lives depended on it. So Joseph sets up this whole situation, and I kind of, if I was looking at this and as I read the story, you kind of feel like Joseph is trying to figure out what to do with them, how to handle them. And, and at first he does come down pretty hard on them and plays with them a little bit, and, and, and the fact that he even treats them so harshly, they, they begin to remember their guilt. They don't recognize him, but they remember what they had done to him. They remember how badly they had treated one of their brothers. Verse 21 says this. Speaking among themselves, they said, Clearly, we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we're in this trouble. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Reuben said, this is one of the brothers. But you wouldn't listen, and now we have to answer for his blood. Of course, they didn't know that Joseph, who was standing nearby, understood them. For he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. See, these brothers had carried the weight of this guilt and shame on their lives all these years. It has wreaked havoc on their mental health. It has clearly eaten at them. No matter how much they have tried to move on with life, it always is there in the back of their mind, lurking in the background. And finally, after this strange interaction where they end up going back to to the Canaan, to, to their father, and bringing back another brother with them, and, and going through, jumping through all these hoops that, that Joseph sets up for them, that they don't know he's Joseph, but he's got all this power. Finally, they get back. The suspense has been building. And Joseph sets up this situation where, before he revealed himself, they would end up receiving mercy from him as a ruler, before receiving mercy as their brother. It says, Joseph could stand it no longer. And there were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly, the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here and not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire place, and the governor of Egypt. Now, hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt, so come down to me immediately. You can la live in the land of Goshen, where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us, Otherwise, your household and all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, Look, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that I really am Joseph. Go tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you have seen, and then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin, that's his youngest brother, and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them, and after, they began t after that, they began talking 
freely with him. What a powerful story. A powerful story of forgiveness, right? And that's, that's one of the things I've always heard this story was used for as, as a reminder of the, the power of forgiveness. And that is really, really important. But there's so much more here for us. You see, Joseph chooses to see that there is something bigger at work in his life. Joseph chooses to refuse to see his life as something that simply happens by accident. And part of releasing his brothers from all their guilt and all their shame is is Joseph telling them and sharing with them how he chooses to see his life. You see, early on in Joseph's life, if you were to go back and read the story, it would tell you that when he was around 17 years old is when Joseph began having these dreams about his future. And Joseph believed and, and, and knew that, that these dreams had something about what was going to happen to him. He knew that there was something ahead of him. And of course, he's 17. He's not sure what to do with all of that, and, and he's going to make mistakes. But Joseph recognized that the dreams... He was having meant something for his life. This is why it is so important for us to pay attention to the way that God is speaking and still speaks to our children and to teenagers. That's why it is so important for us to help them and guide their lives toward how to hear the voice of God. See, parents, I also want to talk to you as a fellow parent. We want to here at Pineville Church help your kids and help you walk alongside your kids. So, do not let the funk of the pandemic draw you away from letting your kids be in settings where they can be encouraged and nurtured to hear God's voice in their lives. Whether it's virtually, and it can happen virtually, or safely in person. And students, if you're watching or if you're in the room today, let me tell you something. God wants to guide your life into a greater purpose no matter what your age is. You are not an accident. Now, I know you got mask on, but surely you agree with me in this room, right? Our children and our teenagers, our lives are not by accident. God is calling you into something beyond this moment. So find ways to listen for God's voice. Look for the evidence of God's presence in your life. You are not too young to make choices now to develop and nurture the God-sized dream that God has for you. Right at the beginning of this pandemic, as it was just getting started, I had the opportunity to go to a conference in Lakeland, Florida. I got on a plane... And I was scared to death getting on that plane. I sat in the middle seat like this. <laughs> Got down to Lakeland, Florida. Didn't think much of it until I walked into the church building. You see, Lakeland, Florida is where my junior high years were. And when I walked into that church, I walked down front in front of the stage. And they all started to come back to me. I remember in seventh grade being in a service. It was called a revivals back then. <laughs> and we would have speakers come during the week. And I remember this one particular speaker, and I know it was on a Wednesday night because we had a youth group there and we were in the service. And I remember him talking about giving God all of our lives. And I remember saying, I want to give God everything in my life. And I said yes to God. I was in the seventh grade. Now, of course, there have been ups and downs since the seventh grade. And I haven't made great choices every time. I was in middle school. And that's what middle school is. But I can look back and I can see there in Lakeland, Florida at Highland Park Church of the Nazarene 
I started to catch a glimpse of God's dream for my life. And God's dream for my life started with me giving my life completely to him. And it continues today. See, God's dream for all of us is that we would come to a point where we know that God loves us so much that whatever we face, God will bring us through it. That is God's dream for us. Just like what Joseph said there in in verse 5. He said, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last for five more, and there will be neither plowing or or harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of this entire palace, and the governor of all. See, Joseph in this moment he sees it he sees what God has done and this reveals a lot about the way that Joseph has chosen to live his life see Joseph's faith leads him away from bitterness towards trusting that God not only had his best interest at heart but also for the care and help of others This is how each time that he would get knocked down, Joseph would not stay down. Because with this mindset, he knows that there's more than just picking yourself up off the ground. We like to say that, right? We like to say, pick yourself up. You get knocked down, pick yourself up. Just pick yourself up. You can do it. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But let me tell you something. Listen to this. It's not just about picking yourself up off the ground that matters. But who helps you get up? is what can have the greatest impact on your future. See, all those times, Joseph could have done it by himself. He could have held on to the bitterness. He could have probably even made it all the way up where he was was based off just being a pleasant person. But when his brother showed up, had he lived his life ignoring the bigger dream God had for him, he could have missed out because of his bitterness. See, Joseph could, his, could have used his life challenges and adversities to make him numb, cynical, and angry. He could have said, he could have said, if there is such a God of my ancestors, then why has all this bad stuff happened to me? Why have my brothers who claim to know the same God I do treated me like this? But instead, he chooses to see how God can take the worst of situations and bring good out of it. See, the Apostle Paul writes, Yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. I'm going to jump down to 28. It says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. I spent some time this week with I have a new friend in the community. He's a, he's a, a, a black pastor, Dexter Howard. And I really loved getting to know him. And, and we started talking about all the craziness and all the confusion and all the disheartening stuff that's happened. And I love what he said to me. He said, Aaron, the devil is so stupid. Because he doesn't even realize that God can take any bad thing that he throws our way and turn it into something good. See, the enemy of God will do everything possible to distract us from God's purpose for our lives. The enemy will do whatever it takes to try and convince us that the world does, that God does not exist. The enemy will try and use a pandemic to make people feel like there's no hope, that God has somehow abandoned us. But we must choose to see and trust that the presence of an unseen God who is working to bring out bring good out of the brokenness. 
choose to see and trust the presence of an unseen one who is working to bring good out of the brokenness. And this God, this God wants to bring hope, to meet needs. He wants to meet our needs, and He wants to meet the needs of those around us through us. Joseph chose to see the presence of God who brought him through all the adversities, all the struggles. And today, the same God is bringing us through the pandemic. The same God is going to bring us through the uncertainty and the fear and the anxiety. He is with us. He has not abandoned us. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're watching online, I'm going to ask you to do the same. I just want to ask you a few questions today. Number one, do you realize today that God has a dream for you? I think sometimes, even when we do the church thing and, and, and the religious thing, we can get so busy. I think even in the midst of this pandemic, we can forget God has a dream for each of our lives. Second, are you choosing are you choosing to ignore God's presence in your life? Finally, this is for every single one of us. What are you doing to embrace the purpose God has for you? What are you doing to embrace the purpose that God has for you? No matter how old you are, if you're watching this or listening to this, God has a purpose for your life. So what are you doing to nurture that? What are you doing to, to help you see it? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for reminding us through the story of Joseph that you are with us through it all. You are the way maker. You are the one who will bring beauty out of the ashes. So God, I pray that we will trust you today. And maybe we just need to take those little steps every single day. Maybe it's just a prayer in the morning that says, God, I trust you with my life. Maybe it's a prayer at noontime that says, God, help me to see your presence. Maybe it's a time when we put our heads on the pillow and we just say, help me just remember, God, where you were at work today in my life. For it's in your name I pray. Let's prepare to receive the Lord's Supper today. On your chairs, if you're at home, if you want to find some ways to, to prepare the elements. I love this thought. On the night before the empire of darkness was about to strike back, Jesus had a meal with his disciples. And the reason he said these words was to help them know that no matter what the empire of darkness tried to do, 
he would still be with them. So he took the bread that was there and he blessed it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take it and eat it. Let's receive it. Likewise, he took the cup that was there. He blessed it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. Take and drink. Thank you, Father, for giving us this hope, this reminder that you are with us. In your name I pray. Amen.